Thank you very much, Maeve. And, uh, and thank you to David and uh, all of the uh, board of the forum for inviting me uh, back this year to speak to you now about a more positive topic, which is the shape of the recovery, as opposed to last year, when we were all trying to feel out for the bottom. But as David has reminded us, um, you all actually remember what was predicted from last year. <laughs> so I do have to uh, breathe a sigh of relief that I was invited back. So I couldn't have been too wrong. <laughs> we'll see how I go this time. <laughs> um, I think one of the nice things about um, speaking about Asia and emerging economies for me is that economists tend to be labeled as being dismal and that we tend to be on the pessimistic side of things. Um, but the nice thing about talking about Asia is that they have been and they will be uh, very strong performers in the world economy, that um, they certainly have much brighter growth prospects um, than what we have seen here. And I think that poses a number of opportunities and lessons uh, potentially for European countries. Um, but at the same time, because I am, after all, an economist, uh, I'm also going to point out quite a lot of their challenges and their pitfalls. Um, so nothing is uh, taken for granted, um, even if growth looks very good. In fact, because particularly Chinese growth looks too good, <laughs> there are problems with growing too quickly. Um, and I think that's going to be the first part of my talk, which is to try and understand what it means when the engine of recovery, which has been the case this year and looks to be the case in the next few years, will be driven um, not by uh, the current advanced economies, but by a developing country like China. What does the world look like if China grows? And what are the challenges for China to sustain this tremendously strong rate of growth? Um, and, uh, and I'll end up with thinking a bit about how the global economy has changed, touching on some of the long-term issues that uh, Maeve mentioned, and uh, what's been going on with global rebalancing. Uh, if global imbalances was part of the backdrop of our problems, then where are we at? Have we rebalanced the global economy? And again, what does that mean for the global economy to rebalance? Now, I, um, I give a lot of these kinds of talks, and I absolutely enjoy them. And one time I was given um, a bit of advice, which is you have to have these divider slides. See, this slide tells you which section of my talk um, that I'm at. So if you're absolutely dying of boredom, and you see my divider slide is on three, you can re rest assured <laughs> that I only have a little bit longer to go. So that's why I use them. <laughs> Of course, the other option is that you could just put your head down on the table, and, uh, <laughs> and I'll get the hint and move on. Um, so I'm going to focus a great deal on China and uh, give you a larger context of the fast-growing emerging economies. This chart shows you that emerging economies, and particularly um, led by China, but also ASEAN, which stands for the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, have grown much faster than rich countries over the last decade. The thing to probably note there is that it's easier for poorer countries to grow faster because they're below the technology frontier. For rich economies to grow, they have to innovate. For poorer countries to grow, they just have to utilize their existing factors uh, more efficiently. So it's typically the case they do have faster growth rates. So immediately you should think the other implication of that is that these economies are also poorer. So for them to be engines, they're actually poor uh, countries, lower levels of income, lower levels of consumption, not quite uh, the kind of consumers that we've been used to with the United States with an average uh, income of 45,000 US dollars. Most of these countries are well below that. China's average income is only 3,000 US dollars, for instance. Um, but the world is changing. Um, this gives you two uh, pictures of what the world looked like just a few years ago and the share of the big emerging economies, these so-called BRICS, Brazil, Russia, India, and China, and the prediction that within about five years, by consensus forecasts, they will be as important as the G7 group of advanced economies in the world economy. Um, but um, if you'll notice on the graphs, the increasing weight of the emerging economy, the BRICS, is actually led by China and 
by India. The predicted share of Brazil and Russia is roughly where it was a few years ago and indeed what it was even a decade ago. So this kind of resurgence is really led by Asia, predominantly by China. China is the biggest share of the growth in weight of the world economy. And in fact, China is roughly the size of Japan today, which is about five trillion US dollars, not adjusted for purchasing power parity. Now, of course, if you have these two countries leading growth, uh, the acronym just doesn't work. <laughs> so BRICS rolls off the tongue, easy to imagine. Um, we really couldn't have the X, could we? <laughs> you can just imagine what the press would do with this. The ickies, the X, the... So we're gonna stick with the BRICS. <laughs> Um, and for those of you who didn't bring your glasses sitting in the back, it should be also very apparent that when you trace out growth rates, uh, the, the red line on this chart is clearly China. China has grown much faster than comparable sized economies, and that is the hitherto rich economies of the world, which is plotted on this graph. But the thing that I always point out, and this is where the shift in geopolitics really becomes apparent, is that the world growth rate has always been about driven by the growth rates of the rich economies, except for the last decade, when the world growth rate has actually been higher than it was in the post-war period, and it's being led by China and emerging economies. So the world grew at 4.2% in the last decade, whereas it grew at about 3.2% in the post-war period up until the late 1990s. And in this graph, you can see the world growth rate is now higher than the growth rate of the rich economies, and this is clearly led by China. And of course, in some sense, this shouldn't be surprising because uh, world GDP, world income, is just a function of all the people's incomes in the world. And Asia accounts for about half of the world's population. China alone accounts for a fifth. And India, of course, if you add their 1.2 billion people in the world with 6.5 billion people, and big Indonesia, which is 200 million, Asia accounts for about half of the world's GDP, and it should do because of population. And it had uh, back uh, in the early part of the 19th century. So in a sense, it's the recovery of Asia after falling behind in the Industrial Revolution. So the change in the world shouldn't really be that surprising since we really should have a world that's much more balanced in terms of income as to where people are earning it. But let me come back to China. Chinese GDP growth has been phenomenal, and the average growth rate of 9% means that China's economy doubles in size approximately every uh, eight years, and that's pretty impressive, and you certainly see that there. Um, of course, there are issues with Chinese statistics, which I can go into in the discussion. But, uh, but uh, overall, looking at household surveys and people's earnings, they have grown incredibly fast. And this is a growth rate which is exceeded by really only one other country in the world, which um, I'm not going to make you guess in the interest of time. But the only country which has grown faster than China is actually Botswana. And that's because they have one and a half million people and a load of diamonds. <laughs> Okay, so how did China weather this crisis? Actually, extraordinarily well. Um, and the main reason is because it had very little financial sector exposure and plenty of reserves. So there wasn't really much of a danger of experiencing either an internal or an external crisis. So there were, of course, some, uh, like all banks, some of the big Chinese banks held, were creditors of Lehman Brothers. So that meant they did have to write down billions of dollars of losses. But the banking system itself wasn't plagued by securitization or toxic assets, the kinds of things which has dragged down the Western banking system. But certainly, they have experienced volatility in GDP. Now, of course, when I give you this figure, you're going to say, oh, that's hardly anything. Chinese growth at the beginning of last year and the end of 2008 grew at 6%. I know, 6%. <laughs> But if you had been growing at 10, 11, 12%, that's the equivalent of having your growth rate, and therefore people felt as if it was a slowdown. Um, so it may not have been much of a recession, and I think many of us here would have very much welcomed that, um, but it did point to volatility in their GDP driven clearly by the collapse in exports, because exports account for about a third of their growth rate. Of their 9% growth rate, three percentage points of it comes from exports, and that clearly was why their growth rate fell from about 9% down to about 6%. And it does point to the need for internal rebalancing. We hear this a lot. When is China going to turn to its own domestic demand? And I think this crisis has certainly focused policymakers' minds. But the question here is, can they reorientate towards domestic demand? 
Um, in one sense, they already have, because government simply substituted for the lack of growth coming from exports. Basically, government spending took the place of a collapse in exports. So China had a stimulus package, which is roughly around 600 billion US dollars. Now, this is nearly the size of the US stimulus package, even though China is only a third of the size of the US economy. Um, the problem, though, with China's stimulus, and why I say it may actually be growing too quickly at the moment, is that it financed it using credit from the state-owned banks. So most governments finance their borrowing through issuing bonds. The Chinese basically issue credit through their state-owned banks to finance their borrowing. The main reason is they have such a big country, it's fiscally decentralized, local governments are unable to issue bonds in order to finance their borrowing. So instead, the state-owned banks were told to lend the equivalent of one-fifth of GDP, perhaps as high as one quarter, to finance a stimulus. So $1.2 trillion were issued last year in terms of credit to finance half that's $300 billion worth of a government stimulus package. And this year, it's essentially going to be around the same amount. So when you tell the state on banks to issue credit, they may put too much out there, and that's what happens. Whereas if you do it via bonds, you can control what it is that you issue. Um, so this has led to potential asset bubbles in the stock market and real estate. And I think probably when we worry about the consequence of this, one thing you always have to think about is, is this additional trillion dollars that's being spent, is it actually going to anything useful, or is it going to generate bad debts in the future? And at the moment, that's quite uncertain. So a lot of this is going to infrastructure, and that is very much needed, because the other issue in China is that local governments are responsible for things like road building. So you find that if you go from one town to another, this town had this much money to build the road to here, and this town had this much money to build the road to here, and then there's a big gap in the middle where you have to take your car and drive on some dirt paths. I'm clearly speaking from personal experience. So there are instances in which this is needed, but there's also lots of instances of waste. China has lots and lots of regional airports and yet no carriers to really service them. So I think that's one issue as to why it is these loans may well indeed turn bad and why the Chinese government is cracking down on it. And I think the other problem when you think about reorientating towards private domestic demand is that very little of the stimulus is being spent on social spending pensions, health, the kinds of things that make the Chinese safe instead of consume are not really fully dealt with in this kind of package. And in fact, you certainly see China's main problem from this graph is that uh, consumption as a share of GDP has fallen precipitously. It's only around 35% now. It had been around half of GDP um, in the early 1990s. However, ever since then, Chinese consumption has fallen fairly dramatically. And in most economies, consumption is around half to two-thirds of GDP. So in the United States, um, on the eve of crisis, consumption was about 72% of GDP and considered to be too high, and Japan is around 60%. So China was at 50%, which was pretty good, but clearly the decline is certainly related to the need to save by many Chinese households. So. This uh, had been a problem the Chinese government had noticed, but they really hadn't put any resources behind. But I think this crisis has focused their minds. But I think the other thing to point out is that this savings isn't just coming from households. It's actually also coming from capital uh, corporations because they save because they have very limited access to credit. So now you're thinking this is very strange. China has too much credit in the system. Most of it is going to state-owned banks, and yet private companies are capital starved because of the degree of financial dominance of the state-owned banks in the system. And any capital market other than banking is so underdeveloped that firms simply have to save in order to grow. They don't, they're not assured of access to either bank credit or to capital markets. And capital controls also prevent these companies from going overseas to access credit. Therefore, there's a very high savings rate. Um, so let me assess what's happened with the infrastructure spending. Actually, it's been pretty good in terms of generating jobs. China's fiscal stimulus package has actually absorbed in the latest field studies done by some of my colleagues 
the 20 million migrant workers who lost their jobs in export factories have now actually mostly found jobs once again, largely as a result of this kind of New Deal public works type of spending. But again, China has to do a lot more um, than that if it wants to sustain private demand, including promoting urbanization, bringing the bulk of the population rural areas into urbanized areas where they can have better job prospects, better income growth. And that one simple thing would actually help liberalize uh, consumption and demand a great deal. So this just gives you uh, what's actually happened in terms of shares of the economy. Uh, another indication as to why it is demand is so low is that the service sector in China is only about 43% of GDP, and this is clearly too low. A services is a large, non-tradable component of uh, potential consumption for its population. Uh, let me just spend a few minutes on the yuan or the renminbi. I don't think any talk on China can overlook the exchange rate, but uh, I'm going to say most of this for the discussion. So I'm just going to quickly say there are certainly upsides and downsides to the dollar peg that China adopted about 20 months ago at the height of the financial crisis. They pegged to the safe haven of the dollar, and certainly the upside is that they were able to maintain their exporters' margins, um, and uh, the Chinese have always been very wary of the fact that underdeveloped capital markets means their exporters can't hedge against risk. That's why they wanted a stable currency to protect them. But the clear downsides is that China's a net food importer, net energy importer, net commodity importer, and a cheap renminbi makes all those things much more expensive. And the Chinese, therefore, have been wasting money subsidizing inputs of energy, keeping costs down to promote industry. So in addition to the inflation liquidity problems, they're also spending money on things which are really quite unnecessary. But the main downside of having a yuan peg is that interest rates in the United States are 0%. Interest rates in China are 5%. A 500 basis point spread is a big yield to chase if you can borrow in dollars and invest in China. And this is why they're getting so much liquidity. It's not just, cons it's not just credit at home, it's this search for yields that's now characterizing the uh, as a result of the loose monetary policy in the United States. So the question is, do they revert back to their 2005 regime? They're calling this a normalization of their exchange rate back to what it was before the unofficial emergency dollar peg. And I think there's every indication they're going to do that if only the U.S. let them do it without losing face <laughs> so they don't look like they're caving to Western pressure. Um, I'm going to spend uh, the next few slides just going through uh, what uh, China can do instead of accumulating reserves, which is another big issue in the yuan peg. Um, China has actually um, began to liberalize its capital account. Um, what they wanted to do is to have globally competitive companies. And recent announcements were they will use their foreign exchange reserves and allow and finance their companies to go overseas and undertake M&A and investments in other countries. So that's one way of pushing down the excess liquidity problem instead of lending a great deal and buying treasuries. What they could do is actually go and snap up some of those cheap assets in the West. M&A always goes up after a financial crisis, and this is a way for them to rebalance their reserve holdings while at the same time uh, promoting uh, a, a, their own industries. And that's something they have actually been talking about. Um, and you see it most evidently in this picture, where China had been so careful to control capital outflows for so long that when they began to launch this policy, you see this rapid spurt in capital outflow. So China going global means that we won't have to, they won't have to have reserve accumulation and uh, buy treasuries. It will just be a question of having a much more balanced capital account to uh, balance their trade account. So the implications, though, for global um, imbalances are that there are already there is already some global rebalancing. The U.S. trade deficit is down to three percent of GDP. China's trade position is actually down. They ran a, a trade deficit in March. Um, and uh, despite what I said about the Chinese not having to buy so much U.S. debt. Um, I actually, my main feeling on this is that, yes, we want to have more rebalanced growth, more consumption coming from China, not so much reserve accumulation, but it has to be done very gradually because just step back and think with all of the money which is going to have to be raised by Western governments in terms of selling debt, do we really want the Chinese and other emerging economies not to buy any more treasuries or gilts or euro bonds in the next few years? 
So liquidity may have been a problem, but uh, I wouldn't turn off the spigot just yet. Um, so I think my outlook for China is that there is a lot of inflationary risk and a potential banking crisis, depending on how much of the stimulus measures goes bad. It's a very difficult policy mix they're trying to do. They're trying to use fiscal policy. They're trying to tighten monetary policy because of worries about asset bubbles. And their exchange rate needs to be reformed, but there's a lot of external pressure. But remember, I get to talk about an economy which is actually growing and weathered the crisis well. <laughs> so they are actually... Um, thinking about the right things now, about reorientating towards domestic demand, and I'm actually fairly posit positive about what this implies for the next few years in terms of more balanced China and a bal more balanced global economy. So I think China can serve as an engine, but just to remind you, consumption is, the consumption base is poor, there's market access restrictions, and there's always the possibility of institutional instability uh, as a result of their dominance of the state-owned sector. But if they can reorient, that is great for lots of countries and regions, as I've pointed out. Lots of people sell to China. It is the world's biggest trader. So implications. I think to think about um, the implications for the, uh, what uh, an Asian-led recovery means, I think we probably first have to say that it's not the case that every emerging economy, even in Asia, weathered the crisis well. Um, Export-led emerging economies did very badly, not as badly as the countries in emerging Europe and Latin America and Africa, which had to be bailed out by the IMF. But China, India, and Indonesia escaped recession altogether, and that's because they have large domestic markets and they didn't trade in toxic assets. So this chart gives you a picture of the Asian tiger economies and, uh, and the United States, as well as the big economies of China, India, and Indonesia. And it becomes very clear that these countries look a bit more like small open economies, look actually more like canaries than tigers. They tend to have much worse output falls as a result of the US uh, downturn. And of course, as a result, they actually bounce back much more quickly um, because exports when they recover, uh, turn the corner. But the big emerging economies have been remarkably stable over the last two decades. So yes, Asia is very export-oriented. Nearly every country has uh, trade is worth more than 100% of GDP. But I think what's been very notable is that they have collapsed. They suffered a collapse in exports this year, but there have been no bailouts in these Asian um, economies. There's been no domino effect. And one of the reasons is, of course, they have been selling to China um, and not just the United States and the European Union. They've been driven by an engine which is much more stable than the US and the West. So economic forecast, again, just very quickly, you can see the Asian NICs, the tiger economies, suffered uh, a big dramatic downturn, but their projections of growth are fairly consistent with what developing Asia looks like and certainly faster than the West. So my last few minutes, um, just to reiterate what this means, looking ahead now, uh, what uh, this might mean for the world, um, there are now a set of new fast-growing large economies. This is the IMS World Economic Outlook latest forecast for the next five years. And what you see is um, China on the very top. Um, I wanted to make that red, but this new Word 2000, the new Microsoft Office 2007 is a little bit beyond me. Um, so this, <laughs> if you look on the top there, it's China and it's India. And what you find is they didn't experience the dip in this recession, and they're basically steadily growing along uh, what roughly the trend growth path they had before. But again, let me just remind you, they're going to be poor for some time. It doesn't matter that they're going to grow at 8, 9, 10%. Their per capita income levels is a fraction of what it is in the West, and that's very apparent in this graph. Um, here's another point I think is worth thinking about, which is their disparate trade positions remain. So even through this crisis, um, it's still the case that the U.S. has run a trade deficit. As I said, it's down from what it was, but the U.S. is still a deficit country. Um, China, Germany, Japan are still surplus countries. There's lots of reasons for this, not having to do with the exchange rate alone, because quite a lot of the deficit is also a reflection of domestic savings and domestic borrowing. So if the U.S. is a very large 
large budget deficit, chances are it needs external capital flows to balance that. And for surplus countries, of course, um, they're still managing, uh, they're still running surpluses because export orientation, despite what I said about China, has not been abandoned. They simply want to pursue exports alongside growth and domestic demand. So it can shift the proportion, but nobody, none of these countries is abandoning export-oriented growth. But a result of this ongoing imbalance um, is if you look at what this means for reserves, um, which is one of the reasons why there was so much liquidity in the world in this crisis, there has been a fourfold increase in reserves over the last decade, um, and most of this is now being held by emerging economies. So if global imbalances remain, liquidity remains in the system. may be very good to help finance some of this Western debt over the next few years, but the implication of this looking ahead certainly are many-fold. And this is, again, another graph just to show you very clearly the uh, orange or red, sorry, Office 2007, I don't know what that color is, but uh, that orange block is clearly reserves being held by emerging countries and by developing countries. And um, so I think what this um, implies is what are we going to, what this will mean for something like the future of uh, uh, stability um, if the dollar is still being used as a reserve currency and if this continues to mean we have excess liquidity. So I know I'm out of time, which is why I'm rushing a little, but I will look forward to the discussion to explore these issues, um, which is just let me finish by saying where are we at? I think the global economy is clearly recovering and it is being led by Asia as the strongest growth engines. Um, not only have they not suffered a recession, there's no chance of a double dip because they haven't suffered. The danger, of course, is there are uh, potentially inflationary risks in this economy. India has already experienced double-digit inflation. So there are certainly risks out there in the short term, but the long-term outlook, I think, is very bright because the world economy has the potential to be powered by large emerging economies, giving us multiple poles of potential markets and consumption than just having a reliance on the U.S. consumer. Um, so does this mean there's a new global economic structure? I would say yes. There are poor but potentially large middle class uh, mar uh, markets in large emerging economies, particularly China. But for everybody else, this certainly also is not just a question of more opportunities. It also means more competitiveness pressures because of the integration of these economies. Um, and I think the question it leaves us with that I pointed out with the reserve issue is one of the causes of this crisis was certainly linked to a lot of liquidity. And liquidity may well generate the next crisis. Um, a great deal of this is linked to the dollar being the global reserve currency. Um, as the United States wanes in its relative influence, will the dollar continue to be the global reserve currency? With the questions over the euro, could the euro sustain its uh, place as a growing reserve currency? Are we going to see a fundamental shift in the kinds of currencies which would be used as reserves? And this certainly raises a lot more issues than just, oh, there's a lot of liquidity in the, economy, in the global economy. Um, where it's held is certainly very important. And my take is that any currency, the importance of a currency follows the importance of the economy itself. And I think this certainly points to a fundamental change in everything from reserves to markets. And it's not pointing west, it's going to point east from here. I'll stop there. Thank you very much. <laughs>